I have a confession to make before I move, uh, move over. Not only did I get a, a doctorate at a school up the river a little bit, uh, I also spent about 10 years teaching at a, at a business school, um, mainly because the gym was just so fantastic there. And I, I had some wonderful experiences when I was teaching at Harvard Business School. What I didn't have was a set of colleagues who helped my thinking along immeasurably, who pushed me and who I could push back on. And it was only when I came back home to MIT in 2009 and joined forces in a very deep way with Eric that I realized the benefits, all the value that can come from having a true colleague and a collaborator. Uh, Eric and I have very different backgrounds, very different training, but we're interested in the same phenomenon, and it's an incredibly productive overlap. Uh, we find ourselves agreeing, I think, about 85% of the time, and it's the 15% where we look at each other and go, you think what? Where things actually get really, really interesting and that lead to some of the, the favorite work that we've done together. So I want to introduce my, my colleague, my collaborator, my co-author, and my friend, Eric Brynjolfsson. Thanks, Andy, for that kind introduction. And, and we do agree most of the time. I'd say it's more like 83% of the time. But, um, <laughs> And it's been a real privilege to have a chance to work with him and the other folks at MIT because, as he said, this is a time when the world is just changing remarkably fast. And we've been privileged to have a chance to interact with some of those technologies that Andy just listed and that our friends at CSAIL and many of our, the alumni and our friends here in Northern California have been kind enough to show us and demonstrate. But it's not just a revolution in the way that technology is changing. There's also been a tectonic change in marketing and in operations and in finance and in the allocation of decision rights and all the other parts of business organization and economic institutions. It's not as visible and perhaps not as well documented, but ultimately I think that will be even more important than the technological changes. There's a big question though whether this is a a steady evolution, a, a transformation that will unfold in an orderly, gradual way? Or is this a, a revolution that's going to overturn the existing order and topple the leaders, both in industry and, and, and for that matter, individuals? The unfortunate reality is that most of the time, the leaders are the last ones to see the revolution when it's coming. The CEOs, the, the kings, they tend to be insulated from a lot of the things that are happening uh, in the, down in the trenches in the real world. It's been said that uh, Louis XVI didn't fully appreciate that he was in the midst of a revolution until he was walking up that scaffolding and saw the guillotine uh, in front of him. Now we certainly hope that uh, our leaders will be in a position to understand earlier if we are in the midst of a revolution, and I think we are, and Andy I think, thinks we are. Um, and understand the nature of that revolution. And to really do that, I think we need to, as uh, Dean Schmidtlein said, not just predict the future, but invent the future. That's our, our secret weapon, our unfair advantage at MIT, is that we do so much of that invention. And again, it's not just the invention of the technologies, although that's certainly a critical and essential component of it. It's the invention and reinvention of how we organize work how we run our society, our economic institutions. And a big part of the reason we created this, or launching this new initiative on the digital economy is to bring together the best minds to think about these questions and focus them on addressing the grand challenges that are ahead of us in redesigning and, and taking advantage of the technologies in a way that they benefit the broader set of people. And when I say bring together the best minds, I don't just mean a small group of faculty or, or students at, at MIT. I mean um, all of you in this room and the alumni network. That's also part of our secret weapon. Um, I discovered early on that the real key to being an effective researcher was not to retreat to my office and, and close the doors and windows and try to think deep thoughts about what the internet could do but to spend time out visiting companies, talking to especially our alumni and other business leaders who are on the front lines making these changes, who are facing the challenges and opportunities. And that is the, has been the catalyst for much of my research and much of the research in this area at MIT. So I'm calling on all of you 
to participate in that transformation. And that starts today, as you'll, you'll hear today uh, from a number of, of renowned experts talking about some of the, the research that they've done and some of the things they've, they've done to transform their own companies. But we also want to have you participate in, in, with questions and comments. And so I know there are mics around. So um, starting after I give my talk, we'll have a little bit of time for questions and answers. And I hope that you will participate throughout the day. And ultimately, that this will be the beginning of an ongoing conversation that we will have. And we will jointly uh, do that inventing of the future that Dean Schmidtlein mentioned in his opening remarks. So let me um, dive right in with some, uh, of, uh, a summary of some of the research that we've been doing, um, that Andy and I have been leading with a group we call the Digital Frontier Team at uh, MIT. And, and much of it was summarized in this book, uh, Race Against the Machine, that uh, you guys have there. And, and you should take a look at it um, when, when you get a chance. But let me highlight some of the, the main themes that came out of that. Um, it begins with those astonishing technologies that Andy listed, the transformation of many industries and the um, really striking ones that are just in the pipeline and that make us so optimistic about the, what, what the potential for the economy. But there's a, another part to the story, and that's that we are really in a period of, of great paradox. And, and that is that on one hand, there's a set of indicators that have done fabulously well. Productivity is at a record high. And if you look at some other economic statistics, like GDP, corporate investment, profits, those are also soaring. Profits have uh, never been higher in the United States, whether in absolute terms or as a share of GDP. So by some metrics, the economy is incredibly innovative and incredibly successful. But we also know that there's other parts of the economy that aren't doing nearly as well. If you look at, for instance, uh, the employment to population ratio, the share of Americans who are working, you see that it's been falling for uh, over a decade. And it kind of fell off a cliff there with the Great Recession. And although unemployment is improving, that is not so much because more people are going, getting to work. It, uh, much of it is driven just by people dropping out of the labor force, which is not a particularly appealing way to, to solve that particular problem. So there's a, a real dichotomy there. And if you look over the past 100, 150 years, this is actually a fairly novel event. Those trends, productivity and employment and incomes, used to rise together. And just in the past decade or so, they've started going in different directions. In fact, if you look at what happened to employment in each of these recent decades, you can look here in the chart, um, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. In each of those decades, there were millions more people working than there were at the beginning of the decade. But the 2000s are different. You can see that it wasn't just the Great Recession, but even in the earlier years of the decade, it was tracking a lot lower. So we think it's not just a, a temporary business cycle phenomenon, but there's something more fundamental going on in the economy that we need to understand. <coughs> and the people who are working, well, they haven't been doing super well either. If you look at real median household income, the, worker, the income of the household at the 50th percentile, you see that that's been pretty stagnant too since the late 1990s. Even if you go back to 1975, it hasn't exactly soared. So there is something puzzling going on, paradoxical going on, that you can have such vibrant technological progress, such increases in productivity, more productivity growth in the 2000s than in the 1990s, which was more than in the 80s or 70s, and yet not have the median worker, the person at the 50th percentile, benefiting from it. So what exactly is going on? What, what explains this? Well, there are a lot of stories out there, and I think that there's a, there's a debate going on. Um, one story you read about in, uh, in the New York Times, it seems uh, uh, most of Paul Krugman's uh, columns talk about the fact that uh, unemployment is the result of just inadequate demand and, and that we need to end this recession. And there are a lot of other people who focus on that fact that we had a really bad uh, recession, the worst one since the Great Depression. And the business cycle, of course, leads to problems with income and employment and some of those other indicators. But I think that that's, well, that's certainly part of the story. That can't explain why things were tracking even before the recession, as I mentioned, we weren't doing so well. And why, as we're coming out of the recession, the recession has ended now, um, that we have had such difficulty getting employment back to where it should be 
and uh, median income hasn't grown significantly. There's another story which um, really was the one that most motivated Andy and I to write the book, which uh, people like Tyler Cowen have said, uh, Bob Gordon, uh, Peter Thiel, and others. And they, their basic attitude is that, as it says here, that we are at a technological plateau, that we just have run out of good ideas, that you know, America used to be very inventive, the world used to be very inventive, but you know, there just aren't big inventions like there used to be. And when you run out of good ideas, then, then uh, growth slows down. Um, when Andy and I read this, we just shook our heads that clearly that can't be right. You know, if you walk around MIT, we can't help but be astonished on a weekly basis by some technology you just didn't think was, was feasible. Or maybe you thought would happen having watched Star Trek, but not for another couple of centuries. Um, and certainly the indicators are that productivity has continued to grow quite strongly. People like Bill Gates say that he's never seen innovation faster than today. So we just didn't really buy the story that we've run out of good ideas or, or innovation. So we had to come up with a story, an explanation, that accounted for both this productivity growth and innovation, and yet the stagnation of median incomes. And when we dove into the research, and some of it, much of it we did ourselves, um, we found that there was an explanation that accounted for all these things. And that is this uh, unfortunate fact that dig digital technologies are racing ahead, but many people are just not keeping up with them. That uh, a lot of people aren't changing their skills and they require a new set of skills. There are new sets of institutions, new ways of organizing work. And that it's entirely possible for technology to grow the pie, to increase overall wealth, to create trillions of dollars of wealth, in fact, and yet not necessarily benefit the, the majority of people. That, that, that Although that's happened in the past, more recently that those things have not been linked as well. And the technology, of course, that has been most momentous in terms of affecting business, as you all know, has been the digitization of the economy. That is the big technology of, of our era, of our generation. And here in Silicon Valley, you don't need to see charts on Moore's Law and the, the tremendous growth of investment in technology. These are just astonishing uh, increases. Uh, the question is, what are the consequences of this rapid digitization of the economy, and how is that changing things? Well, the normal textbook economics are that when productivity goes up, people become wealthier. And if you look at the overall size of the pie, that tends to be true. And that has been true throughout most of history. And it's almost a, 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 an assumption that, that, that most economists have that those go inevitably hand in hand. But the reality is, is if you look more closely at economic theory and now economic, the, the econometric evidence, that they have not been going hand in hand. That it's entirely possible for digital progress to grow the overall economic pie while leaving some people, even a lot of them, worse off. And some of the evidence for that has been quite striking if you just look at that, the income data recently. For instance, um, growth in income has been quite strong, the overall economy, but most of that has gone to 1% uh, of the population, 278% increase in their income. But the median worker, the person in the middle there, has had relatively little growth in income. In fact, in the past 10 years, roughly two-thirds of the entire increase in GDP has been earned by about 1% of the people. The other 99% have, have shared what le what's left. Um, and the reason for that is that technology while it grows the pie, it also creates a set of winners and losers. In fact, it creates three distinct sets of winners and losers. Let me briefly outline them, and they're described in more detail in the book. The first one is the division between high-skilled and less-skilled workers. Uh, it's what economists call skill-biased technical change. The technology can automate routine, rote kinds of work much more easily than creative, exceptional kinds of work. And the first category tends to disproportionately be done by people with less education, less skill. So the technology, therefore, is biased in a way that helps more skilled workers versus less skilled workers. And of course, that can increase income inequality. To just show you some data on this, this is from our colleague David Otter in the Department of Economics. 
And there's a story behind these graphs here. Each of the different colors represents people with different levels of education. Uh, I don't think there's one for Andy who has, what, four or five degrees on that chart. He's kind of off the top. But um, you can see the different categories. And um, in the first part of the century, up through the 1960s, everybody was having their incomes rise together. You know, there's a little differences, but to a first approximation, you can see up to about 1973, incomes were growing together. Then the oil shock hit, and they all fell. They all went down. But it didn't take long before people with more education started having their incomes go up. And we tried to, or uh, David Otter adjusted here for, for demographics. You could, I could show a series of these for each of the different sub-demographic groups. They all look fairly similar. So this is not a, a shift in the types of people going to college. Even just if you account for the same people, um, you get this quite striking change. And it, where it is right now is people with less than college education are actually making less money than they were back in the, in the 1970s for uh, uh, working similar numbers of hours. And all, all of the gain has been to going to more educated people. So that's one category, which is skill bias, technical change. There have been hundreds, if not thousands, of articles now documenting and writing about this. I wrote several of them uh, myself. But it's not the only story. A second story is what I call superstars versus everybody else. This uh, division of work and this division of payoff between a small group of people who can do really extraordinary things and broader group of people who, who are, are maybe good but not great. Um, Thomas Friedman called it the end of average. Uh, you can see it in places like music, you know, where there are the superstars who have their music digitally reproduced and reach global audiences. A uh, hundred years ago, there might have been a, a singer in each town, and, um, but now with uh, amp, uh, replication, they can reach much broader audiences. But it's not just music and media. You also see it in places like software. Uh, this is Scott Cook. We, we talked to him a bit. He's done very well for himself at Intuit. He's a billionaire. And he's done well for a lot of us. I was uh, on a, getting on a plane uh, a while back, and I heard the, uh, the person in front of me was talking very loudly on his cell phone, as, he, as people sometimes do. And he, basically, he was saying to his, uh, his friend, no, I don't use H&R Block anymore. You know, I just do TurboTax. It's, it only costs $99, and it's faster and easier, and it gets all the right answers. And that's a microcosm of what, of course, tens of millions of people do which is they use this quick, efficient program. It's better for them. A lot of consumer surplus is created. It's perhaps more accurate in many ways. Um, and Scott Cook and, and the folks at Intuit, a small group of, of experts who have created a really good program, create a lot of wealth and capture a piece of that for themselves. But at the same time, there are hundreds of thousands of tax preparers who now find that what they used to do isn't really all that valuable anymore. And in fact, the number of tax preparers in the official employment statistics has plummeted, has dropped quite rapidly as their skills become less necessary. And so the same kind of work is now being done by really a handful of people as opposed to a broad set of people. And there are many, many examples of algorithms like that being embedded in software and business processes. Silicon Valley obviously has been a pioneer in figuring out how to do that in many different kinds of industries. And we even see it in mainline companies. Uh, this is Larry Merlot, the CEO of CVS. And we've done some research and found that the gap between CEO pay and the average worker's pay has also gotten much more extreme. And in fact, if you dive in deeper into the data, you find that that's especially true in companies that use IT more extensively, that have codified their operations in technology, in software, in business processes where the CEO can more easily, and, and senior management, uh, can more easily observe what's happening throughout the organization, more easily give directions on what's happening. The result is that the quality of the CEO matters more than it used to, because that CEO can now influence their company in a way that she or he couldn't have as easily in the past. And that has led to a more of a premium on getting top quality CEOs, paying them more, and the average worker, who may now just be following rote instructions from an algorithm and a, and a cashier, ends up being, uh, having less pay and less value and being less essential to the success of the company than they used to. And if you look at the overall data, it's, it shows up very clearly 
This is what's happening not to the top 1%, but the top 1% of the top 1%, the top 0.1%. And you see the share of income going to them is at an all-time high. It has never been higher. There was a peak back in the 1920s, um, but more recently, and then, then throughout the middle of the century, it was, it was fairly steady and only about 1% uh, of income. But in recent years, you can see that it soared, so, soared quite uh, rapidly. So that's the second group, superstars and the rest of us. But that's, if that, that wasn't enough, there's a third set of winners and losers on top of these other two, and that's the division between capital and labor. So this is a relatively new phenomenon that people have started studying, is what economists are coming to call capital-biased technical change, the fact that technology is making it easier to embed things in capital as opposed to labor, and as a result, capital is capturing a bigger share of the economic pie. Now, of course, capital has always been improving, and the economy is becoming more capital intensive since the 1800s. However, perhaps surprisingly, the share of income that went to capital versus labor had been fairly steady for decades, if not centuries until recently, the past decade or so, we have seen a real transformation where profits have soar soared, as I mentioned, and the share of income going to labor, which is that red line there, is falling off of a cliff there. And if you think about it, I showed you earlier, fewer people are working, and the ones that are working are getting less wage income, so you multiply those two together, and you can see that it leads to a smaller share of the pie, a smaller share of income, going to laborers. Now, all three of these trends have at the root of them some fundamental changes in technology, the digitization of the economy. Skill bias technical change, superstar bias technical change, capital bias technical change. They're all different than what we saw in the economy previously, and they can explain why it is that we see a bigger pie, more productivity, but the median worker, the median person, doesn't necessarily benefit. The pie gets bigger, and some, some of that a rearrangement happens in a way that has made it harder for people to participate in the benefits. That can help explain looking back the next 10 years, but we're also interested in looking forward. And what do we see when we look forward? Well, we spent enough time visiting companies like many of yours in, in this room and throughout the world, and uh, as Andy said on 60 Minutes, if you saw it, we ain't seen nothing yet. Um, these are just the early days of a real transformation in the economy. Um, the doubling of power due to Moore's Law, the doubling of computer power that's gone on in the past is going to continue for another decade. The difference, and maybe more, the difference is that it's building on a bigger base than ever before, and it's affecting more of the economy. And so we're starting to see the 60, 65% of Americans who are involved in information processing tasks all having their jobs potentially affected by the Watsons and Ceres of the world and all the other technologies that are being rolled out. And not just them, people who are doing physical work and, and are being affected, whether they're truck drivers or, or uh, manufacturing workers. And you see that when you go and look at some technologies, uh, like let's take a look at at the ones that uh, our colleague Frank Levy pointed out as being important. He wrote this wonderful book called The New Division of Labor, which I used in my classes and I taught from it. Um, and he has a nice section where he talks about what humans can do well versus what machines can do well, what computers can do well. And he gave as an, an archetypal example just driving a, a bakery truck. And he has a little uh, paragraph in there, up, I'll have it here, where he talks about all the difficult things. In order to drive a truck through traffic, you have to you know, absorb information with your eyes and your ears and make split-second uh, changes. There's no real algorithm for how you account for all of that. And as he said in the book, it's hard to imagine discovering the set of rules that can replicate a driver's behavior. I found that very convincing, and I told my students, you know, here's an example of something that you know, machines just can't do. But I, I see a lot of people smiling in the audience here because you know what my next slide is going to be. <laughs> As Andy mentioned, we spent some time riding down Route 101 in this driverless car. And we were just astonished. We couldn't believe this was happening so quickly. Of course, it was an overnight success that had been 
that people had been working on behind the scenes for, for a decade uh, due to the DARPA Grand Challenge and the Defense Department and folks at Google were bringing together different components of it. And they finally all came together um, in 2009, what is that, five years, six years after Frank Levy described and convinced me that it was hard to imagine uh, driving a car in traffic uh, for a robot to do that automatically. And the other example Andy gave was um, what happened with Watson that plays Jeopardy. Uh, we had Dave Ferrucci, he came and spoke at my class and he showed this chart and it was just, uh, just fascinating and I want to uh, walk you through it a little bit here. Um, the x-axis there is the breadth of questions that the uh, Watson can answer. How many different questions it tries to answer or can answer, trying to answer all of them 100% or just a few of them. And the vertical axis is how precise they are, how likely Watson is to get the answer correct. And you can see these different lines there. The baseline when they first started was in, two, in December 2006. It didn't do so well, so well. Even on the small set of questions that it really felt best about, it was getting less than 50% of them right. And most of them, if you look at that brown line at the bottom, was getting less than 20% of the questions right. But then they did another iteration. And by 2007, it moved up to the orange line and had done substantially better, getting 90% in some areas. And basically, the reason that there's a line as opposed to a point is, is they have a little dial. They can tell Watson to, to try to guess more or only go for the questions it's confident of. So you can basically, he can pick any point on that uh, curve there for, for Watson. And what you see is just this relentless, inexorable march up to the northeast corner there as Watson gets better and better. Every few months, they came out with another iteration. They taught Watson more things. They gave it the names of rivers. They taught it baseball scores. They had it read Wikipedia. Uh, recently, I found out that they had it read uh, an online slang dictionary, and they had the uh, unfortunate uh, occurrence that Watson started answering a lot of questions using swear words. So, <laughs> so uh, they had to tie that back. Anybody who's been teaching kids knows how, how you can uh, run into these problems if you let them read the internet without being supervised. Um, so Watson just kept progressing there, up there. And now, you see something else in the chart. You see all those little dots, those kind of like mosquitoes up there? Um, that's us. Those are humans. In fact, those are the best of the best. Those are Jeopardy champions. And each of the points is they had all the scores, all the, the tape of all the previous games of Jeopardy. Each of them is a Jeopardy champion how many questions they answered and how many they got correct. And you can see on average Jeopardy question, champions do pretty well. They're up near the top. The red dots are Ken Jennings. He was, of course, the all-time Jeopardy champion. I think he won something like 75 games in a row. Some people think he's been genetically engineered to play Jeopardy. Um, but he, he did quite well. And by the time uh, Dave Ferrucci showed me this chart in his class, you could see Watson was up at that blue line at the top and looked like he was about halfway to where um, Ken Jennings was. When beat, beat Ken Jennings on a, if Ken Jennings was having a bad day, but not beat Ken Jennings if uh, he was having a good day. Well, six months later, Watson played Ken Jennings for real on television. And as you may know, uh, he won big time. He destroyed Ken Jennings and the other opponent there and came away with the prize. Uh, the good thing is Ken Jennings had a sense of humor at the end of it, and when he gave this final answer, he also put the little parenthetical there. I, for one, welcome our new computer overlords. <laughs> so that's one attitude. And, and we tried, we thought maybe we'd do a little better if we had Watson come to MIT and play a team of uh, MIT Sloan students. And unfortunately, uh, the three students together didn't do much better. Uh, you might not be surprised to know that they really lost it when it came to the sports category. <laughs> <laughs> So what is to be done? I want to uh, leave a few minutes for questions and answers and have some discussion. I want to hear from all of you. Um, so let me not try and go into a lot of detail with some recommendations. We have 19 of them in the book, but we don't think that's the, by any means the definitive list. I think there's more work to be done on the diagnosis. Instead, let me just uh, broadly describe what I think the challenge is and then call on you to help us address this. I think the fact is that digital technologies will continue to accelerate. I think I just take that as a given. You talk to enough people and we're confident that it's going to accelerate. It won't always take the same form. There'll be changes in the form factor. There'll be changes in uh, connectivity and mobility. It's not just a matter of faster chips. It's much broader than that. The other premise is that our skills and organizations, our institutions, 
are lagging. You know, sadly, if you look at Washington, that's probably the, one of the most dysfunctional, if not the most dysfunctional part of society. But even uh, our business organizations are not adapting and changing as rapidly as technology. And our individual skills. Um, this generation, sad to say, the generation that's graduating or that, that's turning 22 right now is the first one in American history that's less educated than its parents. So we aren't keeping up on the skill side either. Now, if you put those two together, I think it's, it's safe to say that business as usual is not going to solve this problem. Those are the kind of uh, opposing trends that led to the concerns that I described in the first part of my talk here. And just doing more of the same is not going to lead to different sets of results. In fact, it's going to lead to more extreme results in all likelihood in the coming decade on, on a lot of dimensions. So what we need to do is think about finding ways to, to transform that, new ways to not just invent amazing new technologies, but to invent new ways of organizing work, new economic institutions, new ways of doing education and reskilling our workforce. You've got the book. If you want to read more about it, you can, you can see it there on your table. There's some of the papers are there on the, on the site as well. But let me take, I think we've got about five minutes left. Let me take um, some questions and comments from all of you here. Uh, yes, right here. I, I think there's a microphone coming to you. Yep. Thank you. David me Saslov, uh, MIT, class of 88, computer mm -hmm. science. Uh, worked a little bit at the AI lab with uh, Marvin Minsky. Oh, uh, perfect. So there was an interesting article today from, your, uh, from Reuters about uh, the Fed marginalizing and more or less silencing those who saw the 2008 uh, uh, banking disaster coming. Mm -hmm. um, the, my question for you is who in government today has the wherewithal to watch out for these kinds of changes that could in fact have you know, negative changes or negative impacts that are outweigh the benefits? Well, it, it's a problem, and, and let me say, I can't speak for the US government or any other government. I spent a little time down there, and, and I, I'm frankly pretty disappointed and disturbed, as I alluded to earlier. We presented some of these, I presented some of them to Ben Bernanke, and um, the good news is he was like, wow, this is, this is remarkable. Some of the things we can do with, uh, with Google searches we did and show them how you can make predictions about the housing market. Um, the, um, the concern, well, not, uh, that, that sounds, let me just clarify what was, it wasn't like he hadn't used Google before. <laughs> I got to check it. <laughs> No, what we were able to do, I, I better describe the research a little bit. Um, there are about 100 billion Google searches a, uh, a month. And if you look at the pattern of those searches, you can see how many people are looking for mortgages, real estate brokers, other housing related terms. And that turns out to be very predictive of real estate prices and sales in Las Vegas, in Miami, in Boston. And by matching that up and doing a little bit more than just looking at the searches, you can make predictions about the future of the economy. And so we showed him how to do that. And it, the encouraging thing was that he was very receptive to, hey, we need to do more of that. You know, the, the I won't say it's disappointing, but that maybe it's not, the not surprising that they weren't doing any of that kind of stuff so far. They were mostly looking in the rear view mirror, looking at old economic statistics, which is sort of the way business as usual has been. That's the way the economy has been run for, for decades, if not a century. Um, I think that the, the tone is changing a little bit. I put up a, a column from Paul Krugman talking about how, hey, you know, the business cycle is the whole story. There's none of this technology going on. Well, that's actually already a little bit out of date. Uh, a couple weeks ago, he wrote a new series of columns where he talked about, hey, you know what? There is this technological change going on in the economy, capital bias, technical change. He actually cited our book and talked a little bit about it. And, you know, people like that and others may be in a better position to change the dialogue in Washington, but it, I certainly think it's fair to say it's lagging. That when I saw the, the presidential debates and all, it was you didn't see these kinds of issues uh, being mentioned at all. So part of the reason we're having this initiative is just to raise awareness. I mean, half the problem is just understanding that there is a problem and trying to, to attack it. We're not there yet. Let's take other questions. I guess there's one right here, uh, right, right up here in the front. Uh, Peter Schwartz from Salesforce and RPI, class of 68. Uh, uh, just in response to the last question and then to uh, uh, Tyler Cowen, uh, on, yes. on anticipating future financial crises. In 1999, the Council on Foreign Relations created a committee after the 97 financial crisis in Asia on 
anticipating future financial crises. I was part of that committee. We presented the results to Alan Greenspan in 2001. Personally, I was in the room, mm -hmm. um, and we laid out how you might anticipate future cr financial crises, mm -hmm. and uh, Chairman Greenspan, he was still chairman at the time, said to the committee, well, we really don't need to do that because we cannot have future financial crises. <laughs> we now know how to manage the system so well, there are no potential financial crises lurking out there. Phew. You can just forget about that it. That makes me feel a lot better. Yeah, so <laughs> that, that was Greenspan in 2000 uh, denying the possibility that it could even happen, mm -hmm. and that you needed to think about the question. Right. More importantly, however, Tyler Cowen, Bob Gordon, and Peter Thiel are all guilty of both ignorance and failure of imagination. <laughs> uh, if one looks around the frontiers of science today, you see whole new industries being born, and that the uh, notion that, in fact, technological progress will not reshape industry and business in the future in rather radical and fundamental ways is remarkably ignorant uh, and remarkably in its failure of imagination. I suspect every one of the people in this room is in some ways connected to some future industry that is yet to be born. Well, you are, you are preaching to the choir here, and, uh, and we agree with you. Uh, Andy and I uh, have the privilege, we're going to be debating Peter Thiel and Bob Gordon uh, at TED in about a month. I, I debated them both, we ought to talk. Okay, yeah, well, you can give us some tips, although I, you know, I think with you, I, I think that, that we have a lot of evidence on our side already. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more quick question, right here. Um, what are the most important forces that you see that are pushing against the revolution that you see? Ignorance. <laughs> I think that the, the biggest, biggest, well, there's two. One, the biggest one is ignorance, I think, that people just don't fully appreciate and understand. It. And I can understand it because, to be very frank, when, when Andy and I first started diving into this, it was, it was very confusing to understand you know, how you could have these trends going in opposite directions. We're like, well, Maybe there's stagnation, or you know, most, one or the other must be wrong. But in fact, they were both happening. You were having enormous productivity growth and and some issues. So you had to, we had to come up with a, a comprehensive story of it. And we're still gathering evidence. I can say that a lot of people aren't convinced yet. Maybe we're even wrong. We'll need to continue to gather evidence on it. The other thing is the thing I alluded to right in the beginning. I think that there's a lot of people who have a stake in keeping things in the established order, and there will be, I think, a revolution. There will be disruption, there will be changes, and that probably will be great for, for most people if we do it the right way, um, but not necessarily everybody. And I think people, to some extent, uh, fear change, and maybe justifiably. And so there's, there's part of it is that as well. But of the two, I think it's more, at least from what I've seen, more ignorance rather than outright <coughs> resistance. It's just that I don't think people fully understand it. There are a lot of people who are very angry. I mean, if you look at the Tea Party or Occupy Wall Street, people are coming at this from all sorts of different angles, and there's, there's a desire to change things. My sense is that most of those groups have, have the diagnosis wrong. And if you don't start with the right diagnosis, you're probably not gonna have the right prescription. And, uh, and that's part of what MIT is about, is helping to invent the future and understand what that, that future needs to be. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate having the chance to share all of this with you. And I look forward to having continued feedback and input on how we can shape this research agenda and what you're seeing out there.